Hello everyone. Ciao a tutti. Happy to be here with you. Uh, I'm Jack Copley. I research and teach international political economy in the UK. And now I'm going to speak a little bit about something that's called financialization. What is it? Why it arose? And what we can do about it? This is based on a book I wrote, which will be out this autumn uh, with Oxford University Press called Governing Financialization. My internet's not really great, so I'm sorry if the video you know, freezes or jumps a little bit. I might have to edit it a little bit afterwards. So it's quite rare for a word from the social sciences to bleed into the mainstream. There have been some examples of this in the past. Um, the most obvious one is globalization, a phrase that was you know first originated in the social sciences and then began to you know, be used more widely in the 1990s and onwards. Another is neoliberalism, which originated with a kind of niche organization of liberal activists in the sort of, in the sort of early to mid 1900s, but is now used all the time ad nauseum. Financialization, I think, is starting to also, you know, become one of these words. It emerged within the social sciences really in the 1990s, but ever since the 08 financial meltdown, it has been used more and more in the mainstream to kind of describe the state of our world economic system. So what does it mean? In a broad sense, financialization means the growing size, share, and kind of the essential role of the financial sector in our modern world economic system. It is the way in which financial logics appear to have kind of seeped into ever more, ever more sectors of our economy and kind of aspects of social life. Now, with regards to a timeline, this is normally associated with the end of the Bretton Woods system around the 19, 1970s. We might say that financialization has three main aspects. One is the sheer growth of the financial sector since the 70s or 80s. The financial sector's share of the overall economy has grown across the rich world, especially in areas like the US and the UK that have these sort of international financial hubs, namely the city of London and Wall Street. But this is a trend that is also spreading around the world. And this has gone hand in hand with the rise of so-called mega banks, which are these huge financial firms like HSBC, Deutsche Bank, etc., that do a range of things. They hold on to your savings and they also make loans. They offer financial services to other firms and they speculate on a financial market in order to earn income for themselves. Now, over the, over the years, these huge banks have swallowed up smaller ones, sort of absorbed them. We have also seen in this, in this era the nonstop inflation and bursting of asset bubbles, whereby a lot of lending and investment goes into a specific asset, and as a result, its price uh, rises way too high and then falls fast. And for a lot of the post-war era, such asset bubbles were actually held back by strict limits on bank lending. But these rules were abolished in the 70s and 80s. And after this, we've seen um, asset bubbles inflate as investors all sort of rush into a certain asset, say housing or the stocks of IT firms, and then explode when these investors move out of this asset en masse. So another aspect of financialization is what is known as the financialization of industry. Now, there was a headline in the New York Times in 2004, which highlighted that the two largest auto makers in the world were actually earning more income from their financial operations than they were from selling automobiles. The financial subsidiaries of General Motors and Ford were earning huge income from making loans. And these weren't only loans to buy automobiles, they were even mortgages. 
And this is a phenomenon that's actually larger than just the auto industry and even the U.S. economic system. Broadly, we have seen a shift across all sorts of economic sectors in many wealthy economies, whereby a larger share of industrial firms' income is from financial operations, which kind of blurs the lines, you know, between industry on the one hand and finance on the other hand. However, financialization is not just, you know, something that happens out there in Wall Street or the city of London or the boardrooms of big industrial firms. Everyday life itself has also become financialized, whether through our student loans, our mortgages, our credit cards, or our pension funds. All of us have become deeply entangled in international financial markets, whether we are aware of it or not. It's a fact of life. So financialization is this expansion of financial logics into all sorts of different aspects of modern economic life. However, it has also gone hand in hand with something else, which is the slowdown, the stagnation of the underlying economic system. So in the, in the rich world, we have seen slowing investment, slowing output, worse jobs, lower wages, etc. since the 1970s. And Italy has not escaped this, as many of you will know. And this is also starting to also become a global phenomenon, with even the kind of the strongest industrial economies in East Asia also beginning to slow down. And no matter what states do, they can't seem to reignite high levels of growth. The former Obama economic advisor, Larry Summers, argued uh, that the world economic system has long been mired in a state of what he called secular stagnation, whereby even really, really low interest rates have not been enough to kind of spark a new boom. So there's something really wrong with capitalism. So for me and for you know several other academics, financialization is not only about the growth of finance, it's about the growth of finance and the slowdown of the underlying economic system, both of these at once. This raises the question, did one cause the other? I would say that the sort of mainstream view argues that the growth of financial markets has slowed down, has held back the underlying economic system. Why? Well, f firstly, as financial elites have gained more influence in the 1980s, they spread this idea, this ideology of shareholder value, which means that the main aim, the main objective of firms' managers should be to maximize their firm's share, share price. This means that firms have put less money into R&D, uh, into hiring new employees or buying new industrial machines, and instead and instead have used any income that they do earn to buy back their own shares, thus inflating their own firm's share price and making, you know, the shareholders very, very wealthy. Overall, then, this argument insists that the financial sector has sucked income and profits out of the industrial sector, leaving a very small amount of money left over for new industrial investments. Now, this view sometimes comes with a certain sort of politics. So if you think that the underlying economic slowdown was caused by the rise of finance, then in order to go back you know, to a more equitable economic system with high growth and good jobs, we have to repress the financial sector. We need to impose strict regulations on banks. We need to... Uh, limit international financial flows, and ultimately we need to kind of rip this leech off of our economic system. This implies that we can go back into the old economy, the, the sort of good old days of booming industry, strong unions, uh, large welfare state, etc. If only we can disempower these, these financiers and rent seekers. However, there is another approach, and this approach says that the underlying economy is not weak because of the rise of finance. Instead, 
Finance has expanded because of the weaknesses of the underlying economy. Now, after the now after the Second World War, there was a huge worldwide economic boom. National economies built up their industries, expanded at high rates, and were able to use this growth to fund new social compromises, meaning strong unions, uh, good welfare states, lots of jobs, high high salaries, etc. However, this boom slowly died out, and as each firm made an attempt to outdo all other firms by producing more output in less time, the market it became flooded with industrial goods, with output, and this drove down prices and ultimately profits. Now, if profits are low, firms won't invest, and so this led to this deep economic stagnation ever since the 1970s, because firms were no longer able to earn good returns on industrial investments, they decided to move their savings into financial assets, into you know financial markets where higher returns could be earned. This caused both low industrial investment and expanding financial markets. So states in the 1970s and beyond accelerated this by liberalizing finance, which means, you know, uh, scrapping bank regulations and abolishing limits on international financial flows. Why did they act this way? As a desperate response, you know, to this underlying deep economic slowdown of the time, as an attempt to sort of breathe some kind of dynamism into an otherwise weak economy. And as a result of this, there was an explosion of finance, but it was a symptom of a underlying economic malaise, a sickness within the real economy. Now, I think now I think that some version of the second explanation is stronger. I can't explain exactly why here, because uh, there's just not enough time, but I think that lo- logically it sort of makes more sense, and there's more evidence, you know, that supports it. In my book, I try to show exactly why I think this, at least with regards, you know, to the UK economic system. Uh, so I guess you'll all just have to learn English and read my book. Um, but if this approach is right, then it implies a different sort of politics. To put shackles on the financial sector would not herald this new economic boom, but it would just reveal the weak state of the underlying economy. To to euthanize the rentier would not bring back the old days of good industrial jobs and high incomes, but would just end that one area of our economic system in which firms can still earn high returns. So with this approach, there are really no easy solutions. Instead, this approach asks us to look hard at our economic system itself, not just the financial sector, to basically have a look hard at capitalism, to attempt to understand why this economic system drives itself into into a stagnation, not as a result of outside elements, but as a result of its own inner operations. And it asks us to aim our activism not at singling out the the uh, a financier or the banker as the source of all of our woes, but at building forms of social life that do not go through the market, that are not mediated by money, that are not done just in order to turn a profit, ultimately that are not capitalist. Ways of feeding ourselves, sheltering one another, making and sharing out all the essentials of life that are based on ideas of of democracy and of empathy and planning. So it's easy enough. <laughs> um, uh, but I think I'm out of time, so I'll end it there. Thank you everyone for listening and have a good day.